Wasn't it a lot of fun? And uh, Mother of the Year, can we put our hands together for all our mums, grandmothers, godmothers, aunties? I know that in my household, my wife does an incredible job. Like today, I was here at church while she was getting the kids ready on Mother's Day. So thank you. Happy Mother's Day to my wife. But in my house, it's, it's a group effort as well. I've got amazing aunties and Amachi, which is grandmother, uh, Tanya's mom. So I want to thank all the people that helped my family as well. Also, we've got awesome youth leaders who just are always around to help out with my kids. I'm busy, you know, neglecting my family. And, uh, and they're just here. Where's my kids? I don't know. The youth leaders over there making sure they're fed and nappies are changed. No, I'd, I'd do that. I'd do that. Well, um, and also, 10-year 10, 10 anniversary of our Mops Seton Ministry. Can we put our hands together for our Mops, our Mops team? And a, a few people, we won't mention them um, today, but we'll thank them later, who have been on the team for that whole decade. And so that's a, a great ministry. And we love kids, preschool kids, families, and mums. And we just have, I, you may not have known just all the ministries that we have connected to all these different groups of people. And they're just doing an awesome job. Well, happy Mother's Day. I'm, I'm really excited to be sharing with you today. Uh, it's kicking off the second week of our Against the Flow series. Pastor Tim shared with us last week about stand out. Everyone say stand out. And today the title of my message is stand up. And I'm going to be talking about standing up today where we're looking at one of the most incredible faith stories of courage and bravery in the entire Bible where we look at the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Who loves that story? So it's great to have our uh, primary school kids, our youth and kids leaders and youth leaders in. These guys do an awesome job. And so we're going to get a little bit youthy today and, uh, and hopefully it's going to be uh, a little bit loud, a little bit crazy. And so we're going to jump into a story today where we're looking at, again, King Nebuchadnezzar. Last week we looked at Daniel 1 where we got introduced to Daniel and his friends that denied uh, what the king was offering to them as they had been brought into exile into Babylon where they had a different identity in terms of their names. They had a different purpose and they had a different diet. And so they, they, choose, they chose to go against the flow of what was happening around them in culture. And we've been encouraged in that, that as Christians, we are not the majority. In fact, particularly those who are in younger people are in public schools or you're in um, different workplace or educational settings, you'll know that it is not popular most of the time to be a Christian. In fact, most of the time people think that you're stupid. Oftentimes in this day and age that we live in. But we are called to go against the flow. We're called to stand out rather than to blend in. We're actually called to shine our light rather than just to blend in with what's happening around us and for uh, the culture to actually shape our lives. We're actually called to be shaped by Jesus. So we're called to go against the flow. That's what we did last week. This week, we're looking at the next part of the story where Daniel and his friends were working for King Nebuchadnezzar. Very prideful, very powerful man. In the time, a bit of a history lesson, broad brush strokes is that King Nebuchadnezzar was a prideful man, but he was an amazing man. He was a prodigy, a leadership prodigy, a political prodigy a, uh, in terms of warfare. And there was no, someone had said that there's only ever been probably six people in the history of humanity who, is, who have had the sort of power, political power and world power um, that King Nebuchadnezzar had in terms of the Babylonian kingdom. There, he was unrivaled. He had created this incredible city, which was Babylon, which was beautiful, which was one of the ancient wonders of the world, that had hanging gardens, and it actually was incredibly beautiful. So this was King, King Nebuchadnezzar. He was the man. And, but like many other people at the time, he worshipped multiple gods. He had local gods. He, and as we learn today, is that he took things too far. Because at the start, Daniel and his friends actually became to work in his administration. They worked for King Nebuchadnezzar. And so what that tells us is that even though we might be working for a boss or we might be working in a place which is incredibly difficult to be a Christian, 
and where people actually above us may disagree with us on fundamentally what our convictions are and what we believe, it is possible to live and work and learn and faithfully worship God in that environment. It is not impossible. Even though we live in a toxic world to our faith, it is what we learned last week, it is possible to actually survive but also thrive in that environment. And that's what we saw in Daniel and his friends. They didn't just survive, they actually thrived and became, they got promoted and they were highly successful in a difficult environment. And King Nebuchadnezzar gave them the room to be able to do that. But today, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar crosses the line. Where the freedom where they had to worship and to outwork their Christian, in their, their faith convictions in God, that they had scope, which was taken away. And where King Nebuchadnezzar says that you can no longer exclusively worship your God, you can still worship your God, but you also have to worship me and our gods. And he took away their liberties and their rights to be able to do that. So King Nebuchadnezzar crossed the line. And so we got that first scripture in Daniel where we, we know the story where he sets up this um, big golden statue in honor and worship to himself. And he, and he brings all the significant and influential people from the city. And as we read in, in Daniel 3, where he says, not only are we going to have this cool statue, we're going to make it like a church service, we're going to have music, we're going to have a meeting leader. And Rachel, Nick, you did a great job today, by the way. And so we know the story is that all these, this, these musicians started to play and to kind of um, anesthetize the people to what was going on in this environment. And so, but what we see happen, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, King Nebuchadnezzar, you've crossed the line. I've had enough. We're done. You know, before we were working for you and it was okay. We were able to do our thing. We were able to worship our God. We were able to go about our, our, our practice of worshiping Yahweh. And you gave us room to be able to do that. But it's come to the point where you've taken away this thing that we, is so precious to us. Where you're trying to control our worship of God and say that we cannot worship our God exclusively. And you're trying to dictate the way that we're doing that. A preacher I heard say that they, they just had this amazing faith as soon as this started to happen and then they made this choice all of a sudden as if it was this impulsive thing that we're going to be happy to be executed for our faith. I find that highly doubtful that, that they made that choice in an instant. I think that it was based with sound reason, that they thought this through, that they weighed it up, that they counted the cost of what was going on. I really, truly believe that. But they came to this place where they thought, enough is enough. We're drawing the line. You've crossed the line. I had a situation very similar to this. It wasn't. Very similar to this in my life where someone took what was sacred to me. They crossed the line that should never be crossed in my life. There was one time a youth leader was at my house, um, spending time with my wife. It was obviously a female. That would have been inappropriate if it was a guy. Um, and awkward laughter. Um, and, and so I came home. I was at church, came home for lunch. And my wife, the night before, had cooked this incredible risotto. I mean, there was high-quality bacon in that. There was three different type of cheeses. I mean, this thing was gourmet. My wife is an incredible cook. And so... You know when you've got just this leftover meal that you've just, it's, you're distracted at work because you know lunch is coming and, and you're just so excited about what's, so that was what's going on for me and I rushed home at 12.30 and I got my bowl of risotto out and, and I heated it up and I was just, I was just savouring it. The, the smell started wafting into my nostrils and for whatever reason, I popped out, I think I was doing something with, with the kids in the, other, in the toy room and... Um, and it took me a few minutes, I was distracted. And when I came out, here was the youth leader. And, and I, I went, I opened the microwave and my food was not there. Where's my food? 
And at that point, I thought, that's fine. Somebody had taken it out for me very, very thoughtfully, maybe sprinkled a bit more Parmesan on it. But that was not the case. I said, where's my food? Where's my risotto? And, and the youth leader, I looked over and she had this look on her face, which gave away the fact that she had eaten my food and that my blood started to boil. But even at that point, I thought, surely, surely she's just had a little bit of food, a few mouthfuls, because she knew it was mine, right? It was like, because if it was in the fridge, it's like, okay, you know, you didn't ask for it. That's, that's still not okay. But it wasn't labelled, fine. But it was in the microwave. I put it from the fridge in the microwave, hit it up. It was obviously, I was obviously going to eat it. There was, there, you couldn't mistake it. And, and so at that point I thought, no, she's just taking a few mouthfuls. And I'm like, where's the rest of it? And, and at that point I realised there was not one little bit of risotto left. It was all gone. I lost it. I lost it. I, I just, I've never been in so angry in all my life. I swear. And, and I scared her. I, I, it's, she crossed the line. And I actually had to apologise for how angry I got <laughs> in, that, in that moment. And, but you know, sometimes, sometimes a line gets crossed where enough is enough. Where you actually have to say, I'm done. I'm done with this thing. I'm done with this situation. And this is what Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had, that they waited up and they realised that a line has been crossed in my life that should not be crossed. There is something about my worship and something about the name of God that, that King Nebuchadnezzar crossed that should have never been crossed. And when that line was crossed, they knew that it was not time to compromise. It was not time to go with the flow. It was not time to say, this is okay, I can deal with this. Because they had been living and working in the administration for long enough. But a time came, they said enough is enough. And I'm not suggesting for you it's a boss or it's, it's anything like that or it's a belief system around you because I think most of the time in this world, we have freedom of religion in our society. Even though there have been pressures on that, as we've seen in the media, as Tim talked about last week, most of the time we can still authentically set an example in our faith and worship God uh, without we've got that freedom in this nation. So maybe for you, it's not an alternate belief system or culture, but maybe it's something else for you in your life, which is wanting to steal, kill and destroy your worship of God. Something, that, something that's taking away from your worship of God, which is, which is impacting your relationship with Him. Something that is setting itself up and taking your worship, taking your time, taking your affection that should never be taken away from God. All, all of that should be going to God. And I don't know what it is for you. And I don't know, you, you evaluate it for yourself, but there is only one person who deserves that worship and that is God. It's not, he's not to be shared with all these other things in our life. He's not to be one of the good things that we listen to, or not one of the things that we, we place our hope in, not one of the things that we draw, um, draw our satisfaction and deepest meaning and purpose in our life. He is to be the one. He won't share us with other things. Did you know that? He is alone, the God. Some of us need to start looking at the things in our life that we're sharing with God that we're worshipping, that we're creating as idols, that we're giving power and authority in our lives that only should be reserved for God. And we need to draw a line and say, only God deserves that in my life. These things in my life, I am done. I'm not going to mess around with it anymore. I'm not going to say, yeah, but a little bit of that is okay. A little bit of that kind of attitude, a little bit of this kind of belief. I'm done. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego drew a line in the sand out of their convictions and their defense of God. And they said, I'm done. You've crossed the line. And so we see in the next passage that they stand, they get pulled before 
King Nebuchadnezzar, who was furious. We could have that next passage up. Who's furious <clears throat> in verse 16. And, and he basically says, all right, I'm going to give you another chance if you'll bow down before me. And he, and he doesn't give them any wiggle room in that matter. And we read this awesome passage in the Bible. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know that we will not serve your God or worship the image of gold you have set up for us. Enough, we're done. The line has been crossed. I choose to refuse to worship something else other than God. Previously, they'd been able to make it work. They had the freedom to worship, but no longer. I wonder what things in your life are stopping you to serve God freely. What things in your life do you need to cut off and say, I choose to refuse to worship and give power to these things in my life? So then what happens? They get thrown into the fiery furnace. The people who are carrying them get burnt up. I just really want to watch some sort of a, a reenactment, a documentary, a movie. I don't actually know how that happened. I can't picture it in my head how they were thrown in and how they didn't, how that all happened. I just don't, I just don't know. But they were thrown in and then we, then we saw um, what was happening. And then the, the most dramatic bit happens in the story. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and we were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any other god except their own god. Therefore, in verse 29, I decree that the people of any nation and language who say anything against the God that they serve will be cut into pieces. This is, this is a bit before on. Be cut into pieces. He hasn't learnt. For no other God can save in this way. No other God can save in this way. How could, how could Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego stand up in this way? I tell you that they knew something deep within in their life with their heart and their mind that was unshakable, that they knew something before that King Nebuchadnezzar was only learning after this, that they knew that there is only one God, that they knew that there was only one God who can save. There is only one God who can do a miracle like this. There is only one God who can take away our sins. There is only one God who can give eternal life. Don't you believe the philosophies and the common beliefs of our society that would try and tell you that all religions and all belief systems lead to the same place. Don't believe all these ways of thinking and believing that would say that Christianity is just like every other religion. That it is all equally true and all truth is relative. That is, that is just not true. And that every religion, including Christianity, has exclusive truth claims. And that Jesus himself made so many exclusive truth claims. He left no room for us to say that Christianity is just a part of a picture of the puzzle. It's only a part of the truth that when you bring it all together, that's how we actually get truth. And that's what's true. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except exclusively through me. And again, time and time again, he made all these claims about there being only one way, being only one God. And when we weigh Christianity up against all these other religions and other belief systems, we say we see no other belief system that would compare 
to the claims of Christianity. No other belief system, no other God who would come and give his life and sacrifice himself voluntarily for us, that he would suffer and die. We see this in no other belief system and no other religion. No other God can save in this way, as King Nebuchadnezzar said. You know, we can run to things that we can fill ourselves up with, that we can get pleasure from, that we can find meaning in. There is a multiplicity of things in this world where people can chase after to gratify themselves and give themselves meaning and purpose and happiness. But at the end of the day, they are all temporary. At the end of the day, there are, you, these things will make you happy, but will be for a time, and, and they will ultimately leave you empty. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew that there is only one. There is only one who can ultimately satisfy. There is only one that can ultimately fulfill. There is only one that even though things don't happen for me, for us in the body, there is one who can give me meaning, purpose, and eternal life throughout all of life. There is only one who can do that. So no matter what you take away, no matter if you take away, yes, it's going to cost them, they knew it's going to cost them their job. It's going to cost them wealth. It's going to cost them the presence of their loved ones in relationship with them. Incredible cost. It's going to cost them their reputation. But do you know what? There is something that is so much greater and so much more valuable and so much more precious to us than all of these things. And that is our soul. That is our salvation. That is our eternal life. That is our relationship with God. And so they knew no matter what you can take away, no matter what you can rip out and steal, kill and destroy from my life, this is the most precious and important thing. No matter what I lose, I'll still have that because there is only one who can save. I wonder, for us, have we, are we so worried about our reputation that we were too afraid to stand up for God? When his, when his reputation gets marred, when, when people are, are giving all sorts of false claims about Christianity, not just about yourself as a person, because as Tim shared last week, we're not just called to stand up for ourselves, we're actually called to shine a light for God in this world and stand up for others. Are you so worried about your reputation? Young person, primary school student, high school student, do you know that God calls you to stand up and that there will be a time that your reputation might be on the line, where he'll call you to actually put that on the line? And so no matter what people may say about you, that you care mostly about what God cares about you because he wants your exclusive love in his life. Other things can satisfy for a time, but only God can save. You know, there are many paths that we can take, many things that we can look to. But in the end, they lead to destruction. And we see that what shall it cost What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they understood this, that their soul was so much more precious, that their salvation was so much more precious than anything else that the world can give them. Why don't we stand together this morning as the band come and join me on stage? There is only one God. There is no one who compares. There is no one who can show up in our life. There is no one who can show up in our fire, who can show up in our deepest need, who can actually give us what we truly need. That we have a God-shaped hole in our life that, that we can try and fill with so many things. And we call those things idols, things that we would place our hope in for the future that would give us seek to give us confidence for walking through in our day. These things could be pride. These things could be pornography, wealth, lust for more things. 
popularity, wanting to be successful and impressive in the eyes of others. Or maybe we're just living for pleasure and for leisure. And that these things that we're actually, if we were to be honest, that we'd know that we're not standing up against these things, we're actually bowing down to them. We're actually giving away, in maybe small ways, some worship to these things that do not deserve our worship. I want to encourage you today to make a stand against these things. To hear the words that, that God is a jealous God that He wants your heart, He wants your love, and that He alone is worthy of our worship. He doesn't want to share you with anybody else. In the same way that a husband and wife are not going to be happy sharing their spouse with somebody else, there's that jealous love that doesn't want to be shared. God has that for us as well. Do you need to make a stand today and just say, in your heart and in your mind, count the cost and say, these things have actually been ruining my life. These things have been driving a wedge between me and God. These things have been setting me on a course that is in the wrong direction. That it's my way and not God's way. And God's calling me back onto His way. A way where there is grace, forgiveness, restoration. Restoration. But it starts with saying, enough, I'm done. You've crossed the line. It's taking me to a place where I will not go. Maybe you need to make a stand in an area of your life today and repent. But not just repent and confess. Yes, that is important, but also to convert, which is to change your course with God's help. Or maybe today you need to make him your only one and acknowledge that that there is only one God. There is only one person who can forgive you. There is only one person who can save you. There is only one person who can do the transformational miracle in your life and that you'll realize that he's wanting to show up in your fire, that he's going to show up at your point of need. If you, you would call out to him, if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord that you would believe in your heart that Christ was raised from the dead for you that you can give your life to Him today, you can open your life to Him that you can receive salvation that you can have new life new purpose today come on calling to go against the flow. In a moment, we're going to sing this beautiful song called Stand. Where what can I say, what can I do, but give this heart completely to you, God, completely to you. And it will stand. It's God calling you to stand up today. To stand up and to know that He is the only one. The only one. And to count the cost. As we sing this song, I want you to come forward as we sing and we're going to have, I pray we'll have a number of people down the front and prayer leaders, ministry leaders, you can stay in your seats for now. We're just going to have, I'm going to pray for everyone together. But why don't you respond to what God's doing today? Let's just pray together. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you for the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I thank you that you are wooing us, that you alone are God, that you alone are worthy of our worship, that we are created by you, and that we are created for you. And Lord, we today we confess and repent of the places where we are other things that are not you, where we are pouring our worship. We have been bowing down. We have been giving over power and have had a place in our heart that should not be there, Lord. 
thank you that your forgiveness is here, your restoration is here. And Lord, as we make a stand in our heart, that you will give us the courage we need to stand. Stir our hearts, Lord. Is God calling you today to commit to Jesus and receive Him for the first time today? Or maybe to commit to Him afresh, to lay down your life afresh, to worship Him. Amen, amen, amen.